Welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast, inspiring real women with a passion for fishing and the outdoors to go get their adventure on. Now, here's your fearless host, Angie Scott. All right, everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast. I'm super happy to welcome back Gail Culp to the show from the CETO Foundation. Gail, how's it going? Doing real well. Thanks for having me, Angie. Yeah, it's almost been a year, not quite, since you were on the show last. We did a couple episodes um, to talk about two different programs, the um, Life Jacket Loaner program and the Sober Skipper program that you guys do. And so I uh, wanted to have you back on, just kind of had a hole here in uh, in between episodes where we could do a quick catch up and got some big travel coming up. I don't know, are you planning to go to ICAST this year? I'm not going to ICAST. Um, actually, uh, I have my first trip will be um, in September to oh, okay. the NASBLA annual conference. Okay. So excited. That to will get be back. my first trip. Okay. Good, good deal. I'm sure you're excited to get back out there. Yeah, it's been a long year and a half and um looking forward to seeing people in person again and it has been neat doing the video thing, but mm-hmm. um yeah, in person is just such a different experience and I'm really right. excited about it. Well, and I'm for listeners this week, I'm going up to Lake Erie to fish for smallmouth with uh again with Brittany Howard. If anybody remembers, we were up there last month doing walleye fishing and so we're excited to get back up there again with Midwest Outdoors T V show. So that should be coming out. I'm sure I'll do an episode next week kind of recapping our experience smallmouth fishing on Lake Erie. But um so Gail, you've had some before we get into the updates, you've had some exciting uh fishing things going on lately, didn't you? Yeah, actually, over the summer, um, very early summer, I think it was May, um, I took a fly fishing lesson, and I've never, ever fly fished before, and so that was a really neat experience. A uh, state park near me hosted it, and I um, provided all the gear. You didn't have to have a fishing license. They actually never attached a uh, um, lure or a hook or anything to it because the instructor said he didn't want any face piercing. <laughs> Um, so that was probably a good thing. There were about a dozen of us and, um, we were able to, it was easily socially distanced across the, um, lake and just practice the process of casting and, and kind of just reeling it in and out, in and out and doing the fly fishing. So it was really cool. Nice. Did you feel like you kind of picked it up fairly quickly? Yeah, I did. Um, it, it, once you get the, the motion, it, it isn't, hard. Um, they described it as basically you pick up an old style phone and then you slam it down and then you pick up the old style phone and you slam it down. So those of us that are of a certain age that experienced that as teenagers, um, it was great. But there were some younger people in the crowd that, what do you mean slam it down? I might break it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, could, you could see their, their brains twirling and I'm like, oh, honey, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that the, uh, described that way before. So that's interesting to think about. I'll have to yeah, try that next really time. It worked out really well. <laughs> yeah, it was neat. It, it was it was a lot of fun and um, I'm hoping to be able to go do it uh, again and actually attempt to catch something this time um, with a family member. He's going to come up later this summer, and so we're going to um, head out and try it out. So let's uh, let's talk about what's going on over there at the CETO Foundation. Um, any any new updates since we visited last time on the the two different programs you got going on? Actually, yes, we um, got funding for our Sober Skipper campaign uh, again this year from the Coast Guard, and that is through the Sport Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund Act. Um, that's where the Coast Guard uh, provides the money to nonprofits. So we're really excited about that, and we're going to be doing some updated imagery and updated videos um, and just kind of taking a look at the whole program and seeing how we can uh, make it even better to get the Sober Skipper message out to even more people. Um, we want people to realize that um, if they're operating the boat, they need to be sober. They need to be aware of what's going on and be able to keep track of everything and also uh, take care of the passengers on their boat and know that they're in charge of the passengers as well as the boat. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really important to take that pledge at SoberSkipper.com before you head out on the water so that you know that you're the designated skipper and everyone else knows that you're the Sober Skipper um, to get them out on the water, having a great day, and then back home safely. 
Awesome. Yeah, I, I had some friends that had a close call out on the lake after watching the fireworks over Fourth of July weekend and uh, came within feet of having another boat almost run them over coming from behind. So I don't know oh, what the issue was there, but my guess is there may have been some, some drinking involved um, being Fourth of July weekend. And so uh, the yep. 12 of my closest friends were on that pontoon that almost got ran over. So you know, it's uh, really important to get that message out there. Definitely. And everybody that we can um, work with, all of our friends in the boating industry, um, just getting that message out that it can save lives. Um, and it's you wouldn't think about getting behind the wheel of a car if you've had alcohol. So why would you get behind the helm of a boat and um, mm -hmm. drink? Right. Very good program. But speaking of, thank you. And speaking of the industry, our um, North American Sober Skipper Advisory Council, um, we have six new members that have been brought on board for that, and um, they'll be attending their very first meeting here sometime this week. And so we have Sh Shannon Aronson from ABYC, uh, Laura Berry from West Marine, Captain Bob May, who hosts um, Bob's No Wake Zone Boating Radio Show. Um, Adam Quant, who is the managing editor of Boating Industry, Scott Rath from Uflex USA, and Chad Tokowitz from MRAA. So we got a really new, great slate of people. Um, they add on to the existing 14 people on the council, so that makes an even 20. Um, so, and one of them is. Angie Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm, I'm so happy to be involved in that. Um, I remember when I was down in Florida over the winter doing one of the, the Zoom call meetings from uh, one of the marinas down there. It was kind of fun. <laughs> People were like, oh, you, I like your background. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to miss this week's one because we're going to be in the middle of filming that day when, when the meeting happens. So I'm sad not to be able to be there to welcome the new members aboard, but hopefully you'll be able to extend a welcome to me from them uh, during the meeting and fill me in. I'm sure I'll get volunteered for something since I'm not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds, yeah, that's sort of the way it works without when you don't attend meetings. But um, we'll definitely miss you and we'll get you filled in on everything going on. But we're excited that we're going to be having our third year of our National Boating Industry Safety Awards. Um, the applications will be opening this fall. So one of the things that the committee or the council is going to be deciding is um, some of the details related to those awards um, and the categories for the awards. So we um, basically use the awards to uh, thank and recognize boating industry members who are going above and beyond in terms of showing and showcasing boating safety in their um, materials, whether it's their advertising or their websites or if they're offering classes or something like that. So we um, honor power boat manufacturers and um, other uh, manufacturers like gear and equipment and sailboat and en engine uh, manufacturers. And then we also look at the media outlets and uh, marine distributors and marine retailers. So it's a really neat way to um, thank everyone who is promoting boating safety for doing so. And um, we also want to thank Kicker uh, Marine Audio, who is our title sponsor of those National Boating Industry Safety Awards. Yeah. And is there a giveaway going on right now or did that already happen with them? Actually, that just ended. We mm. had it from Memorial Day to July 4th. So okay. it just ended last week, and uh, we have picked our winner. And as soon as we can, we'll be announcing her name. So she's super excited about it. Um, we just are uh, getting everything finalized in the background sure. before we make the big announcement. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get her prize to her so we can get some photos to go with it, too. Yeah. Great. Well, I was involved in the, the voting process last year, and there are some really great companies doing, you know, really good things in, in voting safety and trying to get the message out there and being responsible um, to, you know, help with that. So I'm excited to see what we, what we got this year coming in. Definitely. So. And I mean, it's everything from promoting life jacket wear to using an engine cutoff switch to taking a voting safety class or, um, just updating people on a uh, certain type of boating safety. So like the navigation rules or knowing um, red buoys from green buoys and what do they mean? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's lots of different things. Uh, just getting that word out in the industry is so important. 
And speaking of the the kill switch, I don't know if I've even talked about this on the show, but there was some uh, exciting stuff that happened this year as far as that goes with um, that actually being a requirement to have attached now. Yes, it's now a federal law to have an engine cutoff switch um, lanyard in a boat um, recreationally while you're um, underway. Mm -hmm. So um, it's definitely something that we want people to know about. Uh, We we don't want people to head out and not have that attached. Um, And we have a um, option at the CETO Foundation um, that if you want to make a donation to the CETO Foundation, um, in return for your donation, we will get, send you a engine cutoff switch wristband that can easily attach to your lanyard. Mm. So you don't have to worry about figuring out where to attach that little coil thing. Um, so it'll clip onto a Velcro wristband. And you can do that, um, find out our information at boatingsafety.com slash ECOS for engine cutoff switch dash wristband mm. so ecos dash wristband mm. and um information is there but um the law applies to boats under 26 feet so if you're operating a boat that's 27 feet you won't need it but um boats under 26 feet as of april 1st are required to um make sure that that engine cutoff switch lanyard is attached to the operator of the boat um while the boat is in motion mm. I just pulled that up online, and I'm totally going to have to look into this because one of the issues we've had with uh, Freedom Boat Club is figuring out how we can make an easy way for our members to be able to attach these to their person. Um, Sometimes those clips are really hard. It's hard to find somewhere to clip them on you, you know, if you don't have a life jacket on that has a a ring on it or something that makes mm-hmm. it easy. So yeah. Those and women great. swimsuits don't have belt loops like men. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. These, so. these look awesome. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for this episode. So people can check that out and make a donation and get them some wristbands. Um, Definitely. And then, and then the other option, if it's something that you wanted to um, invest in, are there are wireless options as well. Oh, really? So there's multiple companies out there, but Felmarine is one that, CETO works with, um, and the wireless options, it's a fob. So it's a in, it mounts to your engine, and then everyone on the boat can wear the fob. And it's sort of like uh, some of the newer cars out there. You don't actually have a key. You have a fob to start your car. Mm-hmm. Same idea. So hmm. you wear the fob on your life jacket or on your waist or, or clip to your um, bathing suit strap or whatever you want to do, but anyone on that boat that's wearing the fob, if they go overboard, whether it's because they hit a wake or they leaned over the gunnel too far or they were trying to, to land a fish and the fish pulled hmm. them out instead of the other way in, um, it, the engine will stop. Very interesting. So um, it's a really neat system. Um, it's a wireless engine cutoff switch, basically. So instead of having to have the lanyard attached to you, everyone wears the fob. And um, you can get as many fobs as you have people on board. And then you have the um, system mounted to your engine. Right. Or it mounted to your um, where your key goes. Gotcha. Okay. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. I like that idea a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. and then so we also had some updates with the Life Jacket Loaner Program since we last spoke. Yeah, definitely. Um, our grant is underway. Um, this is another grant that we get from the Coast Guard, and um, we have over 140 new Life Jacket Loaner Station hosts that wow. we're going to be working with this year. And of those, at least 50 of them are going to be setting up new stand locations across the country. So we already have at least 750 stand locations. So we're going to be talking about over 800 by the end of the summer. Wow. And um, the life jackets going out to them, we've got about 8,500 life jackets that are um, ready to go out. We're just waiting on the order to come in. So we did have some delays on those orders. Mm-hmm. Um, for those that aren't aware, there's lots of shipping delays all across <laughs> the country on lots of different things. And some of the things are weird, but like <laughs> life jackets is one thing that's delayed. Furniture is also delayed. So mm-hmm. if you're waiting on a sofa, I, I've had friends that are waiting months for sofas. <laughs> and so, um, but uh, just some very interesting shipping delays that are going on around the world. Um, so as soon as those get out, uh, we should be getting those to those new hosts. 
and then next year's applications for the Life Jacket Lunar Station um, program will be available starting November 1st. So anybody that wants to get life jackets for the 2022 summer um, will be having information about that on November 1st. So I know it's still really early, but um, we do like to let people know about that because sometimes they're just now realizing that they need life jackets. And um, unfortunately, all of our life jackets are already spoken for. They're all going out to those new hosts, but uh, we definitely want to make sure that people know that they can get them for next year. Awesome. And remind people who can apply for that. Um, We work with uh, state parks, national parks, uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, We work with family organizations that have set up something in um, memory of a family member that has passed away. And then we also work with uh, businesses and organizations and um, cities and municipalities that are have water um, that they're worried about people being around. So um, if you have a, a city boat ramp and you want to make sure that the boaters going out that city boat ramp um, have life jackets, you can set up a life jacket loaner station. Um, a lot of Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, um, groups like that, they also host um, stations as well. Great. I've been seeing a lot more around as I travel around to different lakes and stuff and fishing tournaments and things like that. So always happy to see those options there to help people keep safe when they're out there boating or swimming or doing anything in the water. So Definitely. And all of the information about our Life Jacket Loaner program is available on our website at BoatingSafety.com. And then we also have our map of all of the Life Jacket Loaner stations. It's at BoatingSafety.com slash map. So you can check out all of them and where they're located. So if you're traveling and you realize that you forgot to pack a life jacket for um, a little kid, we have life jackets from infant through adult extra large on the Mm stands. So we really can fit anyone. That's great. Um, So anything else coming up you wanted to touch on before we uh, sign off for, for this one? Actually, we do have one new grant um, that we're working on, and that is um, related to flare disposal and um, electronic flares. And we're working on the Coast Guard with this as well. Um, For those that aren't aware, uh, boaters on um, large Great Lakes and um, waters that connect to the Great Lakes as well as uh, ocean um, are required to carry marine flares or some type of visual distress signal. And if you carry an actual flare, a pyrotechnic flare, those expire 42 months after they're manufactured. Mm-hmm. So whenever they were made, you've got 42 months from that date, not 42 months from when you purchase them and buy them off the shelf. Mm-hmm. So there'll be a sticker on it that tells you when they expire. And the carriage requirement that the Coast Guard requires, um, you have to carry them if you're carrying the pyrotechnic version, they have to be not expired. So the problem is, what do we do with all these expired ones? Because 42 months, it's a little over two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's really no national flare disposal program. Some states have options that you can um, take them somewhere to be disposed of, but there's really no one system that works all across the country. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at how we can help get that done for the Coast Guard. And at the same time, we're also helping educate boaters and make them aware of the electronic visual distress signals that are out there, the e-flares. And these are Coast Guard approved. Um, They do not expire, unlike the pyrotechnic flares. And they cost about the same as maybe two packs of two or three packs of your pyrotechnic flares. So cost-wise, you're not replacing them. They take regular batteries that you can find at your local um, store, Target, Walmart, hardware store, whatever. And um, they put out a really bright light um, that lasts a lot longer than a pyrotechnic flare. Mm -hmm. And they also have that light, um, has the option of blinking and an SOS signal or just being a straight light. So um, lots of different options there, but uh, we're kind of working on both of those at the same time. So really exciting stuff. Yeah, lots going on. Lots of great things. And so I'm excited to kind of see all the improvements and all the different things you guys are doing and kind of be a part of it on the uh, Sober Skipper National Advisory Council. So um, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I just want to thank you again for taking some time out on a Monday of all days (laughs) to uh, do do a quick update for us. So I appreciate it. 
Sure thing. Anytime. And I hope that your uh, filming and uh, fishing adventures in Lake Erie go really well. I hope Looking so, Looking forward too. to hearing all about it. All right. You, you sure will next week, good or bad. Hopefully it'll be good. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. You take care. All Thanks right. again for having me on the show, Angie. Thanks so much.